Thanks so much for everyone to come here. I'm so delighted to share my experience. Well, uh, this presentation is actually one of my doctoral dissertation papers. Uh, that is, uh, my doctoral dissertation is about environmental conflicts uh, related to urban planning, spatial planning in Bogota, the, cap the Colombian's capital. And I'm looking at different ca uh, like a s case studies, like a particular case studies, and this is one of them, like a farming community in the urban frontier in South Bogota. And this paper is right now on the review. I mean, it's got certain reviews. Now it's like a getting in a second stage, a major revisions, let's say, but yeah, it's still in, in progress. So uh, I, I would like, like uh, to hear from you certain feedback, uh, even more practical, because actually this work is uh, basically more a critical socio-spatial theory. I mean, it's not as much like uh, environmental management or uh, like uh, to be clear that this is like a very m rather political ecology uh, standpoint, but uh, with the purpose like in a way to improve the current policies. I mean, how to use better certain concepts, how to understand better uh, like uh, the policy making and participation at the local level. So, and this is the best place to do so, of course. So let's begin. And this paper is working with my two supervisors in Finland and at the University of Eastern Finland, Juha Kotilainen and Mati Salo, who is my external supervisor in the Natural Resource Institute in Finland, Lukke. And this research has supported by uh, Seiba Foundation in Colombia and funding by Colombia. Uh, so, Let's begin with this quotation about uh, one of the interviews that I had conducted in Bogota in 2018. I was talking with uh, a practitioner, an environmental planner. And well, as for the Colombians, probably it would be familiar, but it still is kind of like a shock in, in a way to see these kind of expressions that the countryside, that we call it in Spanish, el campo, has been seen as the backwardness, like uh, the underdeveloped. And it was very strong, but at the same time it's meaningful because even though Colombia nowadays, its population uh, is bigger in the urban settings than in the rural areas, Colombia still has a strong roots in the countryside, very strong. And also, in a way, to understand how has been conducted the urban and political conflict that we have been going through. Uh, but at the same time, there is this urban-rural connections uh, that also in the cities, I mean, this conflict is happening, even in the, like in Bogota, like in the district itself. And the peasants has been the most of the suffer of the communities in Colombia towards the environmental conflicts and urban conflict, the most vulnerable people, but at the same time, they are the providers of food uh, they are the keep safers of water, uh, but sometimes they are the very stable identity of the campesinos, of the farmers in Colombia, that is between the marginalization and between like uh, the romanticization of their means of life. And this is very dangerous because the romanticization uh, could detach uh, their setting. What are the environmental and spatial injustices that they had in like a suffering and going through. So this is like a, one of the points of departure of our research. And we are asking us, uh, what happens when the rural farmers don't migrate to the city, but rather the city expands to the areas of, of residence? Because always, and especially in the so-called global south and in Latin America region, all over, uh, there, there is like a common analysis of the rural urban migration but we never see what is going on in the peri-urban and metropolitan regions. So that is still, there are some uh, farmer communities that whether they had been historically living there and just they start to face how the urban growth start to happen. But at the same time, mm, there are also like a people from peace and backgrounds coming to these peri-urban areas. With different, I mean, this is a longer history, uh, but in a way, how to understand that is a very complex human settlement processes that these people is still are living in this metropolitan area. So we have identified in our research practices and strategies that the farmers in the southern urban frontier in Bogota employ to deal with the pressures of urbanization in their everyday environments. So this includes access to political mobilization, the conflict related to environmental issues, 
active resistance to urban development, uh, urban development and improved management of the physical landscape and, bi and its biodiversity. So, well, uh, so what does it mean? In, in this is our case study. Uh, yeah, it, it tends, even for the actual Bogotanos, for the people that live in the districts, they tend to forget that, yeah, Bogota is the capital, but the district, uh, let's say 25% of the district is the city itself. I mean, there is no like a legal metropolitan area. I mean, surrounded like uh, the Savannah of Bogota region, that is where Bogota is located at. Uh, there are around like uh, 20 more municipalities. Uh, but inside the district, we have like uh, 20 localities. That is how it's divided the, the district in terms of uh, administrative purposes. But only the 25% of the population is concentrated and is let's say like at the further north of the district, uh, but the 75% restant is rural land. And foremost located in this region that is called like uh, the high Tunjuelo river watershed <coughs> and the Sumapaz region, that this Sumapaz region has been historically uh, famous in probably one of the most important and relevant uh, uh, agrarian struggles in the high Andean in Colombia. And even has relation with the political army as, uh, as uh, conflict as well, with some insurgents groups and like uh, trying to advocate land rights. But surrounding, I mean, also even some, these areas are part of the Paramo ecosystem that is one of the strategic ecosystems that are very unique. I mean, Colombia is uh, the country that has the most amount of this Paramo. I mean, Paramo ecosystem is a high Andean ecosystem that is only located in five countries, in, the, in, in South America, and in Costa Rica is the other country that has Paramo properly, but the others are Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela. But Colombia has the most, and Sumapaz region is the biggest of this ecosystem. So are very, very, uh, they are very strategic, and this region are located in natural, na na national natural parks, and like a, that they were supposed uh, to supply water. But coming back to the Bogota district, from the more than seven million inhabitants in the district, about 16,700 people are in the rural areas. That, yeah, it's a very a small amount, but they are very important because they are just located in about more than 70% of these rural lands that are holding this kind of like a very important uh, ecosystems for water supply and even food supply, like uh, such as vegetables and, uh, and dairy products mainly. And we have in the land use master plan, a kind of uh, like a, a scientific uh, technical concept called main ecological structure, the structura ecologica principal, what most of them uh, is embracing uh, like a protected area such as hills, the paramos itself, uh, wetlands, rivers, streams, and not only in the city but in the city region as well. And our uh, study is focused on in the Os Usme and Ciudad Bolivar localities. So we are not properly uh, working on Sumapaz region or Paramo de Cruz Verde and Cerros Orientales region to the east of the district, uh, that uh, they are not properly in front of the urbanization, but we are just in this area that is the peri-urban, actually like a facing and challenging this uh, uh, urban growth. So what are our theoretical standpoints? So in our research, we are understanding the rural as a part and parcel of urbanization. Sometimes it's very like a, a counterproductive to still like a splitting and divided what is rural, what is uh, uh, urban, what in the city, what in the countryside, there is a lot of connections there. So we are, this is our point of departure in terms of theoretical frame. And we are taking into account this concept of the urban frontier instead of perurbanization because the perurbanization is the planner gaze. I mean, it's very technical. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying that it's not a good thing, but sometimes this like a planner gaze, it's in a way, not acknowledging other dynamics in the territory, in the lands, like a more cultural valuation or 
uh, even political uh, position from the communities that live, are living in these places. So, and we are taking upon a relevant, a relevant concept that has been discussed a lot in, in the Anglophone geography theory and political design that is territory, but in the Latin American tradition of the social sciences and especially geography, sociology, anthropology, and even from the grassroots movements, uh, territory, it doesn't mean the state nation formation. It does mean uh, like the land, just the land where the people lives, uh, the mother earth, even the body. I mean, we are like a taking into account like a disconnection between the different like uh, theories or, or theorizations, not only the Anglophone uh, uh, debates, but also at the same time like a more situated and especially in this Latin American and particularly in Colombia context. So in these regions, I mean, when you have like a, the urban and the rural, you are ended up with territorial assemblage. That is like a very, very uh, kind of like a bombastic concept in a way, but it's meaningful because assemblage is like a meaning like a different layers on these landscapes. I mean, that you cannot do different kind of like a splitting. Oh, this is urban, this is rural, but everything is intertwined or uh, go back and forth. So in this metropolitan region like Bogota. Uh, so then again, this I, I said already about the territory, but uh, we are also understanding the territory as a social uh, processes on the making, at the making. So in our, in our case study in Bogota, we are talking about the territorialization, the de- and re-territorialization, that uh, in a nutshell, and you can read it on the slide, but I'm not going to get longer, but territorialization is how people or subjects, institutions have to define a certain space as their possession with a specific rights of use for such a space. And the de- and re-territorializations are just like uh, the inclusions and exclusions process in the land. How, for instance, the deterritorialization is the dispossession of land, the dispossession of water uh, for certain stakeholders, for the people that are living at, and the re-territorialization is how these people are contesting renegotiation of the everyday life uh, this kind of like a uh, exclusion processes, such as the urbanization, the unique urbanization, how the impacts of this unique urbanization in Bogota that I will explain a little bit more uh, concrete uh, what it's about. And we are referring about the urban frontier, that then again, uh, this is like a, the closest, according to us in our research, to the way that the inhabitants in this uh, peri-urban area in Bogotá, in Ciudad Bolívar and, and, and Usme, they understand the territory as a border territory. They say that this, this is the territory of order, this is our ter territory border. Uh, but at the same time, this territory of order in Bogotá could be framed taking uh, a quotation of a Colombian scholar, sociologist Manuel Pérez, that he's saying that these territories are immersed in a double dynamic of occupation, uh, with which we refer to fringe between the urban periphery and the defined suburban areas in which rural communities live, where there is a still no great densification and there is a still an intensive division of small plots which share their means of production with recreational residents of urban dwellers, housing centers of social interest, or even dormitories or urban employees. So these farmers are sharing the space with these kind of stakeholders as well, like a simultaneously uh, with the urban growth itself and the implications of the urbanization that I will tell then again uh, further in the presentation. And we are also taking into account that uh, the concept that was coined by this uh, a Brazilian urban scholar that she was training in UCLA in Berkeley in, in the United States, Teresa Caldeira, about how the urbanization has been understood in the Latin America region and uh, that uh, the auto construction and the peripheral urbanization, that that means that because it tends to be from the Anglo font theory about uh, that in the global south uh, there is a lack of planning. Uh, uh, but especially people in, in the margins or the people in the local communities to face like a, this precarious planning because it's not a lack of planning, it's just precarious. And this must be seen in parallel with the legal uh, planning system that especially in Colombia, Colombia is one of the 
countries in Latin America that probably could, uh, uh, could have like a the more progress urban planning system. But the thing is, yeah, because there is a myth that, oh, we don't have planning. There is a lack of planning and blah, blah, blah. But I mean, there is a planning. But the thing is, what's happening with this planning in the making? What is going on there? Because the, the regulations are there. Uh, all this, like, uh, uh, let's say, uh, normative framework, concepts included in regulations and law are present. But they are not, or whether, poor, uh, like a fully enforced, or they are just like a reshape mm -hmm. or renegotiate among the stakeholders. So, and, sorry. We are also trying to understand that these people are trying to struggle in the effects of urbanization and this like attentions in the planning practice uh, and land use uh, in particular, the land use management through situated knowledge. Situated knowledge is, uh, I mean, how people uh, use uh, the resources that they have at hand according to their condition. Uh, Situated knowledge is not fixed, but it's part of wider networks influenced by uh, and influencing broader political, economic, and social forces, such as globalization, market technologies, and situated knowledge can also intertwine with technical uh, scientific concepts in everyday environmental struggles, which are part of the community strategies addressing deterritorialization. This is a like, like our conceptual understanding of the of our case study. So let's move on to the what, what was our methodology in field? And, uh, well, something that I, I, I didn't tell at the very beginning is that my research, uh, doctoral research project is coming from a long experience that I have had in Bogota. I used to work a as a practitioner. Uh, I used to work as a person working with the state agencies in Bogota, with the environmental office. I also used to work with the National Institute of Biodiversity in Colombia, Alexander von Humboldt Institute, uh, but working also related with Bogota. Actually, we used to have a project in this same area. So I also have connection from there. And also I took part in the local activism, environmental activism for, for, a, for a while. So I tried to collect all this experience uh, to make this research project, including this case study. So, but aside that, we took in this research, the analysis spanning from the 1990s to the present day, and why? Because this coincides in first, like a huge, uh, like a urban transformations in the Bogota region, but the second and foremost, how the planning system in Bogota has started to change and include the environmental imperatives or environmental criteria explicitly in the land use planning. And most of these like environmental criteria, they were like a force by local communities and even the most important like uh, inputs that they were coming from these communities in the rural areas. I mean, uh, you could say, and I have already published one paper from my doctoral dissertation in Journal of Political Ecology talking about how the social movements in Bogota became environmentalized uh, because they were looking at uh, through nature and this kind of landscapes and this kind of conflicts from the 90s uh, to get a right to the city through the environmental like to conservation of urban nature and all these things. So, but most of these movements are coming from these kind of communities in the rural uh, area of the metropolises. So that's why we took that uh, uh, analysis of the time frame. Uh, we use content analysis of the document, bibliography of Bogota's urban transformations and official statistics, like around like uh, almost 118 documents. Uh, interviews with planners, practitioners, social activists, and participant observations of the field. Uh, mainly this field work was between late 2017 and uh, early 2018, but also I was considering like a previous experience for this professional background that I mentioned before. So this is a kind of like a zooming in, uh, one of these urban rural fringes in this locality that is Usme. Uh, Usme, it's like a lot going on here, but it's just like a put it in a nutshell what is happening there. And the farmer communities in this locality have been promoting and resisting their customs, means of production and life against the effects and influence of both formal and informal urbanization developments, 
those communities have come together to organize this urban sociopolitical process, negotiating with several stakeholders and state institutions to achieve their aim uh, against these effects, negative effects of urbanization. So we have here some meetings, uh, cultural activities, trying to reinforce their identities, uh, and some like a landscape, for instance, some product that they have been produced and sharing with certain local meetings. Uh, and we have, I, I, and I put it this, uh, picture in this urban fridge to explain better what is going on in the landscape and uh, you could have here I mean this was like a just a high Andean ecosystem in the this is the area called the Tunjuelo the high Tunjuelo river shed that is one of the uh, Bogota river tributaries one of the main rivers in the city in the south and we have here of course these are like uh, beans and some potato fields and but here you could see like uh, this more formal urban informal urbanization going on since the 80s but combined you can also find like a state housing as well that has been allocated and even from the very beginning in the early thousands it was planned a uh, larger development in this like housing uh, projects like a social housing that they were addressing and targeting, for instance, people that suffer from the internal conflict, like a political refugees from the conflict, coming from the countryside to live in the city. But uh, these places are very, very marginalized, very far away from the city center and the places that you could find certain uh, jobs, opportunities. And the commuting in Bogota is so difficult to reach these places. So, uh, because for the, the city center is just there in, 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 the, in the background. So this is very far, uh, and this is like even higher in altitude from the footplain, the footplain where the city is at. So we have here, but this housing project was this that I mentioned, that it was called Metro Vivienda and Nuevo Usme, like a Usme, the new Usme, was stuck to develop on this area. And here you could find even a kind of like a, a, a transport infrastructure, but it was cancelled because first, because the communities living in this uh, area that is called La Requilina, they were facing against uh, that we don't want any urbanization. But they found in 29, I think it was 10 years ago, it was found like a, an ancestry um, a cemetery, indigenous cemetery. And that's why the project like a block in a way. But if we would, if, if it wouldn't be for this archaeological finding, probably this hou hi big housing project like uh, totally uh, sprawled in that area. But uh, still, uh, there, there are certain challenges and threatenings such as this urban plot, uh, informal plotting and land speculation in this area. So that's in a nutshell kind of. And let's move on to the another window of this case study that is in Ciudad Bolívar that is pretty close. We were here but now we move kind of like a west side uh, that, well, if in Usme the things are uh, hard in Ciudad Bolívar, they are really tough. I mean, in this area is probably when the most critical environmental conflicts in the city region and urban Colombia are situated. Uh, activities such as the district uh, municipal landfill that is so-called Doña Juana, uh, is getting like a 6,000 uh, tons of litter and rubbish per day. And it has been going on since the last 30 years. And it has caused already sanitary emergencies. In 1997 was the worst uh, because the accumulation of uh, this uh, methane and gases uh, created a huge explosion that created uh, more than 1 million uh, tons of landslide in this area and affected like a more than 3,000 people living in this area. And they are still uh, claiming about uh, socio-ecological compensation. And so far, uh, last year, uh, uh, like a kind of like a mm, local court in, in, in Bogota, uh, they started uh, with this compensation, economic and financial compensation. But this process has been first very slow but uh, without controversies, uh, uh, sorry, with con a lot of controversies because now the people that 
were started to receive these compensations, uh, they had been accused that they are not properly like uh, the legal or the legitimate people that they were like uh, uh, the ones to receive and allocate their money. So, I mean, it has been a disaster and nobody has paid. And this uh, landfill has been managed by private contractors. And even to recent efforts to change like uh, the waste management syst system in the city, and it's not only about Bogota, it's uh, six municipalities and more in the, in the Savannah water region, like uh, allocating all this rubbish. Uh, despite these recent efforts to change the waste management system, it has been uh, very hard to change because it's uh, very profitable to, to keep this going on. Like uh, it's, it's very profitable. And also some activities such as quarrying historically. Well, this is in the Doña Juana area. There are some uh, like a soup areas in these localities that are called in Spanish veredas. And this is in the vereda Mochuelo, where uh, Mochuelo Alto, where is located uh, the landfill. And this landfill was uh, imposed with the excuse that nobody lived there, <laughs> was living there. And that was the main decision, the main criteria in 1998 to impose this landfill. But that, that was a lie. That was a lie without any, it was because, yeah, it was a scattered population. But remind, I mean, remind this quotation at the very beginning that the pieces and the, and the people in the countryside are seen as a backward. It's, it's like a, this a still very colonial mindset that if you are not seeing certain progress, I mean, you can, this like an internal colonialism that we uh, still have in Colombia, unfortunately. And this is a kind of like a mural world that is saying like, uh, take care about the environment uh, because the environment is yourself and your community. Uh, even there are some people, this is like a, a one part, they, like uh, the highest part of the landfill. But like on the other side of the road, when I was taking the picture, there are farmer communities. They are producing dairy products. Of course, they had been assisted by universities, local universities, or some uh, scientific centers, uh, like uh, to improve, and of course, like uh, to keep it safe uh, in terms of sanitary conditions, because this environment is very, very hard as us. And this is one of the, uh, like, uh, the most uh, striking images of this thing, like uh, the, the, the festing and the pests that are present there every day, and the people living there are facing this every day. You cannot imagine how much is the smelling of this. And not only the flies, of course, rats. Uh, the soil has been like a, already damaged. Of course, probably some of the products are already affected, such as potato, some of the vegetables that they are producing there. So, and this is like a kind of like a public hearing where the people were like uh, challenging uh, a state agencies and institutions like uh, trying to convince them, hey, uh, uh, this shouldn't be going on. I mean, this must be stopped. And they have been claiming this for 20 years. And uh, it seems that uh, the landfill is still very profitable. And we have like a current elections, uh, running election for a new administration right now. We have elections in late this month. And the debate about this landfill has been totally disappeared. Has been, I mean, not as much present, at least mentioned for somebody, but it's, 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 a, it's a total drama. And the quarrying activities, uh, because this area of South Bogota is very rich in sands, gravels, I mean, all these mountains. This picture is from the late 90s. 90s. I mean, this is not from the real time, but you can see how much was like uh, the environmental impact because this was in the Tunjuelo River. I mean, because the river was like a, um, dragging from the mountains all like a, this material and then deposits in the footplain. When the, it's coming from the high mountain, then through the footplain, and it was like a full of sand and gravels that most of this like a material is the material that Bogota has been building up in the last half of the century. Even to construct the, the routes and the BRT buses route as well, the famous Transmillennial system has been building up from the materials there. Uh, but nowadays it looks like this, that uh, I mean, a local court announced that uh, uh, this should be stopped. Uh, it has been created a huge, I mean, the, the river, the Coos River has totally destructed. And you could see these are like a very poor neighbors, uh, like a labor, uh, like a working class people, uh, neighbors, 
and they were affected by the flooding because the, the river was totally destructed by this activity that they were uh, going on since the late mm, 40s, 1940s, 50s, when this part of the district wasn't part of Bogota. I mean, was a part of, of uh, like uh, another municipality that later on, that it was Usme, uh, later on was like an annex uh, to Bogota in the late 50s. And this is in Ciudad Bolívar, this is more like a sands, but most of this activity, and this is looking from the, uh, from the uh, transmit cable that is like, it, it, it was launched, this, this cable uh, was launched at the beginning of this year, but from the cable you can see to the mountains uh, how much has been the impact. And most of these activities uh, that they are calling in, in, in the local context as uh, mining activities, but they are quarrying, uh, there has been impact a lot and even some of those activities were illegally made without any compensation, anti-technically delivered, and so on and so forth. So a lot of, but well, aside of these impacts, uh, still there are some people living in these peripheries trying to survive in a way and try to make their living. And we have found to this like a uh, uh, research to identify community strategies in, in this, how they uh, still persist and try to uh, survive in, in this like a very uh, uh, stubborn environment. So we have found along our documentation and interviews and uh, all this research work like a two main strategies that can be split in a specific practices. Uh, because yeah, remember that there is a thing that uh, this is in the capital. I mean uh, the communities even though they are marginalized in a way uh, they still have certain connection with the state agencies and institutions. They, 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 they could have certain, uh, like a closeness to the, the state. And the Bogota district is very strong uh, as a, a state uh, body in, in, in because it's the capital, it's the capital district. So there is a lot of resources or capacities in a way, even though there are also at the same time this like a contradiction that what is happening, what is the role of the state here and the government. So. Here we could find specific practices such as acts of resistance in everyday life against high uh, impact activities like the ones that I was showing you, interlocution with the state and government agencies, like a kind of like a knocking on doors every time, uh, interlocution with academia and professionals to receive technical assistance, and contention collective actions such as using existing legal tools and joining urban planning processes. That is a very interesting thing because uh, you would think that because the state or the governments hasn't, uh, haven't been taking seriously these problems, uh, they are against the state. But in this, in this context, they are the ones that they're using the state uh, uh, legal tools to, uh, you know, like a, to require the state agencies and the governments to enforce the law, to do their thing. So it's, this is a very interesting thing and it can be extended in other like uh, social movements, not only in Bogota, but in so other regions in Colombia. This is kind of like a particularity. And we have here like uh, the second strategy, like a general strategy that beside this socio-political mobilization, we have like uh, the landscape management uh, strategy. That is how through the everyday practices, uh, they are doing or foster transition to more ecological farming production and land use practices. Uh, for instance, agroecological production and sustainable livestock husbandry. Uh, they are even engaged with rural tourism, like uh, to make certain pedagogy, especially bringing people from the city. Like uh, to, oh, it, it, there are some farmers here and they are also providing some products and they are uh, keep, uh, like, uh, keep guarding and saving this like a very important ecosystem for the region and, and so on and so forth. And the improvement of water resources. And, and this is a very, an interesting practice that even it can be extended in another research and I know some colleagues that they have found out already focus on in the rural aqueducts. The role of these rural aqueducts is, is key, it's very important how they are using the, the water management uh, like uh, not only to improve their ecological management or to taking care about the land but as a also as a political tool to validate uh, like uh, the persistence in the territory. But at the same time, they are facing that uh, to be enforced legally, these aqueducts, they are competing with the more urban 
uh, aqueducts. So they are putting this like a, they, they have another kind of uh, role. I mean, they are not properly like an urban aqueduct. They are just like a more community aqueducts. But under the law, uh, they are compared and they are put in the trade competition. So it's very difficult, for instance, to, require, to, to meet the requirements in high quality of the water and the quality of water. Uh, I mean, for instance, this certification or the oversight uh, state, con uh, state body uh, agencies uh, that they oversight how it's uh, delivered this kind of like a, a use of water or the regulation of the use of water. So they are also facing this kind of like a more legal challenges uh, uh, in that way. So, but that's it. And this is kind of uh, uh, like a, an illustration of these things that I was telling that, that uh, and this is a, a board about uh, agro-tourism activities. There is a kind of like a path knowing the places and this is like a household, like a very typical. This is especially in the Ciudad Bolívar uh, and Pasquilla area. That is like a upper to the landfill, uh, Doña Juana landfill. And so far, our preliminary discussion based in, in, in these like, uh, findings is this Caldeira's concept of autoconstruction applied to the urban rural fringe because this autoconstruction was more focused on in the urban dwellers. But at the same time, these rural dwellers, these campesinos, they are very connected. As you could see in this picture that I showed that, I mean, the urban neighbors are, very, are there and they have already connection with these urban dwellers. And also there have been a lot of like uh, tensions, social tensions between these campesinos and the more uh, urbanites as well. And even there have been tensions even in terms of crime as well. Uh, because uh, unfortunately these marginal spaces uh, are tend to allocate criminal activities as well because uh, whether of the complicity or the lack of caring of the uh, state, uh, police and army institutions. So uh, it's, it's kind of interesting to see how even in, a, in this very small case, you could see like a, that the urban rural thing is, is very blurred. I mean, it's, uh, it's very counterproductive again, like a to split. And yeah, the campesinos are also uh, making their own environment through auto-construction. So that's why we take more of this concept. And the peripheral urbanization is being contested by the campesinos' uh, action in order to subvert the citizen as well. And there is a beautiful quotation where one of these uh, farmer campesino leaders, uh, his name is uh, Belisario Villalba, and he said once that uh, this is another way to being a city. Like a to, I mean, to be rural is another way uh, to being a city. And this is very beautiful uh, from Belisario. It's, uh, and this is the, the approach that they have been taking on in their everyday life. So, and yeah, I mean, they are, they are trying to challenge this planner's view uh, against this undesired aspects of urbanizations, despite the development of inter interinstitutional initiatives, because then again, it's by no means that uh, there are not regulations or there are not policies. Even Bogotá has a rural public policy that should be enforced. But it has been very, very, very lack of implementation. A lot, a lot, sorry, a lot of back implementation. Uh, it has been very difficult to enforce uh, most of the principles of this policy that they are very progressive, actually. It was issued in 2007, 2007. And nowadays, I mean, it's the, 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 the tool is there, but it hasn't met. Uh, all the principles and goals that they proposed. And it was very democratic. It was an interesting participatory uh, process involving state agencies, uh, universities, research centers, and the communities. But unfortunately, it hasn't met uh, all the requirements. But at the same time, despite this like a progressions in policies, it's still they are you know, like a facing all these uh, challenges and environmental conflicts. And yeah, I mean, they had been like a doing this political process and political agitation to environmental imperatives. That's also another interesting thing here because I mean, they are already environmentalists uh, without the call themselves as environmentalists. But uh, they had been using very, uh, in, a, in a very smart way, 
uh, all the principles of the biodiversity conservation because they have already the knowledge. I mean, they know, uh, I mean, all the species. I mean, there is a study saying that they have identified like a more than 231 species to manage, like uh, from herbs, uh, vegetables, I mean, even edible food from this uh, plant species and in all this region. But unfortunately, the campesinos are caught between advocating their way of life, uh, bringing in all possible allies, because then again, they are not properly against to the state. They are even reclaiming, hey, come on, state, come here. Uh, hey, professional from the university, come here, join us, uh, help us. But it's, it's, they are in this challenge to try to harmonize things with the city. You know, and after all, the city as such has been constructed from rural areas through the unique urbanization in Bogota. So more or less are the conclusions, but uh, yeah, in a way I already said all these bullet points. So this is the close. So I'm so, so happy to hear. I, I hope that 